So I landed about four hours ago at SF4, and it took more than two hours to drive. The traffic <laughs> seems to be getting worse. Thanks. Okay, anyway, I'm glad to make this session. And I've been a professor at Seoul National University for 12 years. And in Korea, there's a saying that if you're either a beggar or a professor, you cannot do anything at all after three years. So <laughs> without my students, I wouldn't be able to do anything. But you know, I'm happy to be here, although I feel like I'm giving my defense talk again in front of all <laughs> you guys. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, so as the name of my laboratory suggests, I was a control person rather than vision. When I was a member in Shankar's aerial robotics team, I worked on the control side and not at all on the vision side. But after I uh, named my lab with intelligence, after 13 years, I realized that without doing some work in sensing, I cannot do anything intelligent. So that slightly changed my approach to the systems that I deal with. So, oops, okay, so I the, it's not gonna go. Okay, so the topic that I'm going to talk about today stems from the accident involving this bridge. So, there's a river in the middle of Seoul, uh, crossing a, so dividing the Seoul into north and, uh, north and south part, and of course the south of the river became famous for the Song Gangnam style. And the, so this is one of like 20 something bridges that cross the Han River. And if you see the top part of this, this column, there's this interesting looking sculpture. And it's supposed to represent the holy flame that's used in the Olympic Games because this uh, bridge is very, uh, located very close to the Olympic Stadium in <coughs> Seoul. And 15 years ago, the military helicopter tried to put that sculpture on top of the column. And they succeeded, but sadly, the Chinook helicopter crashed and then you know, all the people on board died instantly. So when I saw this video clip, I was still in Berkeley back then. I thought that why not use you know, unmanned aerial vehicles to do this kind of dangerous jobs? But then, of course, you cannot specify the GPS coordinates for the, all the task points that you want to do the job. So you will definitely need some sort of sensing mechanism other than the GPS coordinates. So. What, one of the things that we do in my laboratory is something called aerial manipulation. So, of course, the drones are being used everywhere. I'm sure, even though I missed, I'm sure the morning talk you know, addressed some of the issues. And still, many dangerous jobs are being performed by human beings, like the wind turbines and you know, cleaning the tall buildings and you know, checking the safety of the bridge structure and so on. So why not combine the robotic arm with the drone so that they can fly anywhere in the world and you know, do the job on behalf of people? Of course, for the transportation, you can do the sling road rather than attaching the robotic arm. But if you have a multi-degree of freedom arm rather than just the sling system, you can do much more things like you know, maintaining specific uh, orientations and attitudes. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Of course, you know, for many decades, people have worked on the mobile manipulation, putting the arm on the robot. But that's the totally different pro uh, problem from aerial manipulation, because even slight movement of the arm can ruin the accuracy and stability of the flying robots. Right? So here, without robot arm moving, the control is quite accurate, but once you start moving, it gets you know, pulled over due to the movement. So you need more accurate models and different control schemes, because usually what you are dealing with is not going to be known accurately for you, like the object, of, object that you have to transport. You wouldn't know the accurate mass. You wouldn't know the exact force that you have to apply to do some inspection or you know, uh, repair job. 
So we used many kind of robust and adaptive controls, including what I learned from you, Packard. <laughs> and this example is using adaptive backstopping control, where we treat the interaction force with the object and the weight and the inertia as unknown quantity, and you, know, you can detect and move things quite accurately. But in the previous demonstration, we had to specify where the object is. So the next version was to include the vision, very simple one, called image-based visual surveying. The frontward-looking camera is mounted on the palm of the robotic hand right here. And the camera is going to <coughs> detect an object like this. And you know, once you realize the location of the object in the image, you try to center it in the camera view. So once you, you know, approach close enough and the object is centered, you can start manipulating. Of course, what's different from the standard image-based visual surveying is that multi-rotor is an under-actuated system, so you cannot just directly command it to approach the object. You have to be careful in computing the desired trajectory from the vision information. And the next example was uh, slightly uh, getting more complex. So for example, the, for inspection or repair work, the drone has to interact with the existing structure. I mean, you don't have to ask drone to for a drawer in your home for you, but you, know, you have to do some repair work high above. Uh, like the, you know, and draw was just happens to be you know, a challenging example for us because you know, it's constrained. You don't exactly know which direction it's gonna move. You don't know how much force you have to exercise. Especially in our poor man's version, we don't implement the force sensors on the robotic hand, so you have to come up with some mechanism to you know, compute or generate the force enough, uh, barely enough to pull the drawer. So you, know, you drive the force and moment balancing equation, and you don't know what the required force will be, so you have to do the initial guess and try to pull the drawer and the direction of the drawer is not known, but by you know, inversely computing from the motion of your robotic finger, you can estimate the moving direction. And if the drawer is not moving, then you have to increase the force. And of course, the, uh, since uh, with the addition of robotic arm, it's now highly redundant system. So for some uh, for identical tasks, you can either move the drone body more or the robotic arm more. So depending on you know where you are far enough from the object, or if you, are, you know, have to avoid some you know objects, you have to you know, be careful when you are planning which part you are going to use for the movement. So so we included some trajectory optimization. For example, it's safer to use smaller torque with respect to this axis. And of course, you have to avoid getting near the blades for the safety and so on. Oh, I thought I deleted all the equations, but one survived. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, using this kind of approach, you don't have to specify entire you know, attitude for the robotic arms, you, as you see in this snapshot, when drone is pulling the drawer and pushing the drawer, you know, they, uh, it automatically changes its attitude. Oops. Sorry. So here's the experimental results of drone trying to you know, approach the drawer at loca uh, located at unknown direction and trying to either pull or push after recognizing the handle of the drawer. So in the first example, drawer is aligned with the approaching direction of the drone, but even if the direction changes, it can you know, adjust its movement by using the estimation 
of the dual motion. And uh, next thing we are doing is to do cooperative operation using drones. So you can do you know, various pass playing techniques and you know, apply them to the drones. And of course, the difficult thing is if they are connected to an uh, object, you know, one vibra a vibration of one drone will directly affect the other movement. And that has to be compensated by the internal <coughs> mechanism. And of course, we are doing some you know, collision avoidance too. So, for example, you cannot specify the dimension of obstacles that you are going to run into in every day. So, what we do is to we train or we generate optimal trajectory offline for specific dimensions of you know, obstacle configurations. So, the drone is going to run what's optimal against you know, this, some shapes of obstacles. And while it's flying, it's going to use the previous information as dynamic primitives and it's going to generate Gaussian process regression based trajectory online. So, so these obstacle shapes will be different from what it knows but from what it has as primitive database it can generate new safe trajectories that's not far from the optimized one. So now it detected this guy and avoided it. Now it detected this one, so it's going to fly above. Okay, so from the, all these experiments were performed in so called motion capture environments. So we extensively used Vicon <coughs> and we want to get out of it. So what we do recently is to take the vision-based SLAM or simultaneous localization mapping algorithms and apply that to drone. But uh, before doing SLAM, we are doing the visual, visual odometry, which means the no inclusion of map building yet. So the problem with the visual odometry for you know, the autonomous cars and robots, if we want to use them for drones, is that their accuracy is not enough for drones. Like beacons and DGPS would give us, you know, one centimeter level accuracy, but the most visual odometry algorithms cannot do that. And also the computation time. The small drones are usually controlled <coughs> from like 50 to 200 hertz, anywhere between those numbers. And the visual odometry and vision-based SLAM algorithms run like 10 hertz, 10 hertz, and so on. So although we had successful results using the KIDI data set for the autonomous cars, we couldn't fully apply this result for the six stop, six degree of freedom SLAM for the drones yet. So this algorithm ran at 10 hertz and it was you know, relatively faster than most existing algorithms. And you can still see that the some loop closing is not instantaneous it's you no know, like this one. These two ha have to overlap, but it's not and so on. So that's why we deferred the mapping part to the later. We want to do it after we succeed with the visual odometry. So the uh, we are taking a hybrid approach for the visual odometry for drones in a sense that. Most visual odometry algorithms are either feature-based, they use features, detect and match and reconstruct, or the dense approach. So they have pros and cons in a sense. The feature-based algorithms are more you know, heuristic, intuitive, and, oops, and lightweight in terms of the computation, but the accuracy is going to deteriorate if you don't have many features. Although dense algorithms can be, you know, more accurate than feature-based, they require higher computation power. So what we do is to combine these two guys. So if we don't have enough time, we run feature-based. If we have to improve the accuracy, then we rely on the dense approach. So by combining these two approaches, we realize that we can 
uh, boost of the performance without sacrificing computation time too much. Let's just go to the results for the interest of time. So this was the MAB database. Mm. On database, it seems to be working, but we are still working on the actual sixth of visual odometry for drones. And the another problem for drone is that the illumination change can be really critical for drones, unlike the cars. You know, if you are driving, uh, if you are in a self self-driving car, you can just as long as it stays in the lane, it might be safe, although it's not good. But if you are a drone, you have to get the sensory feedback at every time instant. So once you you know are in different unexpected illumination situation, that can reduce the accuracy in a very critical manner. And in fact, most visual odometry algorithms are very sensitive to this unexpected illumination change. So this is a very simple example of you know, just following the wall. And many existing visual odometry algorithms would diverge since the illumination situations change. So to uh, uh, to address these issues, we uh, included the illumination model in patch-based visual odometry. So we tried to estimate some parameters uh, representing contrast and brightness of the image. And for instance, when we, oops. Synthetically changed the illumination in, you know, into four different quarters. Then we, you know, we know true parameters for contrast and brightness. And when we include the visual odometry, uh, illumination change model in the visual odometry, we can, Our adaptation algorithm estimates the true parameters quite accurate enough. And as you saw here, our algorithm would not diverge in this kind of situations. Let's see. And the, the only visual automatic results we have yet is planar flight. So this video clip shows the fully autonomous visual odometry based flight using the smartphone. So there is a smartphone looking downward and we are using the Bayesian correspondence between features instead of deterministic one. We realize that when you are dealing with the vibration of the drones and you know, low quality cameras like the smartphone ones, it's much better to use the probabilistic approach than deterministic feature mapping. So still, this result is limited in a sense that we use planar assumption. It's not full six stop yet, but you know it's running on smartphone fast enough. So our next task is to improve this result to full <coughs> six stop flight, and the results that do not depend on explicit features like this. That's what <coughs> we aim for. So we are working on vision-based operation of flying robots, and it's an interesting platform to address control, perception, and past planning. <coughs> and I thank you, Shankar, for teaching me the difference between verification and validation. So he was always very supportive, but the most critical comment I ever got from him was, do not mix the words of verification and validation. After all the, these years of experiments, I do realize that theoretical verification and experimental validation are really different, as you can see from these clips. <laughs> so these are my, uh, my daughter's favorite video clips. So I show them to my daughter and see, if you don't eat enough food, you, you become like this, you know, <laughs> you cannot lift anything. <laughs> 
So this is what I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.